hold hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to The Ghost Story Guys. Welcome to The Ghost Story Guys. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Ian Gibbs. And this is a show where we talk about spooks, specters, and all the other things watching us from the shadows beyond the campfire. Some conversations only make sense after the sun has set, and this is most definitely one. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 97, and we're coming to you from that tiny mountain cabin you dream about but can never quite reach. How you doing, Ian? I'm doing okay, Brennan. How are you doing? I am good. I am good. I'm glad that you've survived Halloween. Of course, this is our first post-Halloween <laughs> record, and you are still alive. It was touch and go. It was a rough night. Oh, right. Halloween night itself was, was pretty pretty uh, hairy for you. I forgot about that. Mm-hmm. People were firing fireworks up the street. Oh, God. Yeah. There were a myriad of drunks out and people generally looking to be abusive. Is that unusual for a Halloween uh, ghost walk or, um, or is it is it more amped up this year? I think it's more amped up. And I'm not going to say the street people because it's not. It's not the homeless. Right. It's young people hanging out downtown and they are taking up a lot of the space left behind by people who used to go downtown and like go for dinner, go to the clubs, whatever. Right. Those people aren't down there anymore. So these, this group has taken over. Aimless um, suburban youth. Yeah, pretty much. And um, they're not good. They're not good. They're uh, the week before Halloween. Uh, I think I told you about getting caught up in that big street fight downtown. You know, it's funny you bring up the mega brawl that you managed to get find yourself mm-hmm. embroiled in a little while ago, because just prior to Halloween, I did an interview for the Capital Daily podcast, and that was the very last question they brought up, was they wanted me to tell them about your brawl. Oh, that's funny. So your reputation precedes you and me at this point. Ian Gibbs, street fighting man. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm glad you survived. Me too. And of course, Halloween is now over, but you know, it's really interesting I, because I... I I saw this tweet and it it really, really twigged for me. And it was that, okay, so Halloween is over. Everyone's talking about how bummed they are that it's, it's passed. And, and, you know, now they can't watch scary movies anymore and and all these things. And they said, what says who you're an adult. (laughs) You can totally just keep doing this. I thought that, yeah, it's, it's kind of like that for us. I mean, Halloween is kind of our Christmas in terms of our numbers, but I mean, every day is Halloween. Here at the Ghost Story Guys HQ. Yeah, I mean, I'm still doing ghost walks. Like, I've got two to do in November. So, it never really ends. This is, no. oh, and, and, and I'm writing a book, another book about ghosts. Like, this is just kind of my world. So, you little yeah. amateurs with your one day a year thing. <laughs> yeah, you can be a weird bastard any day of the year. It, it just, you know, yeah. it costs you social engagements after a while. But yeah. apart from that, you can do whatever you want. Well, and I, you know, I don't run around and like, goth clothing or anything like i don't look like a you know well only after we asked you to stop repeatedly (laughs) but so you know people don't know any better they just think i'm a middle-aged normal dude if only they knew ian if only they knew (laughs) right the things i've heard oh god (laughs) just before we head to the break uh you have some news to share with everyone do you not my audiobook is finally set free upon the world A Strange Little Place, available... No, 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 it's called (laughs) Victoria's Most Haunted, available where everything awesome is sold. It's true. It is true, and you made it happen, so thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. You were literally the voice, although I did have someone uh, get in touch with me and say, I bought the audiobook, but it's kind of messing me up because I'm hearing Brennan's voice with your voice. (laughs) Yeah, I shouldn't have done the Ian impression for four yeah, right. hours. So. <laughs> I'm being good. <laughs> Chapter five. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I mean, I'm grateful that I have a strong voice as far as literature goes, but uh, literature, did you hear that? Um, I, I thought you misspoke. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, it's exciting. It's fun. I'm really glad it's out there and I, I hope people enjoy it and buy it and listen to it on their way to wherever they're going and yeah, I hope so. Anyway, yeah. please. It please. <laughs> please. Oh god. <laughs> I got bills to pay. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> and if you want to pick up a copy of uh, Victoria's Most Haunted, you can find that really anywhere audiobooks are sold. I know uh, Strange is limited to ACX slash Audible uh, slash Amazon, but because Touchwood Editions published the audiobook for Victoria's Most Haunted, you can pick that up pretty much anywhere. It is on Audible. It is on Amazon. You can absolutely use your Audible credits to buy it. We'll still get paid. 
leave a review if you can. It would certainly be appreciated as long it, as it's a it really five helps. star review telling us how handsome we are and how and how wonderful the book is. Well, let's not add lines to the list <laughs> yeah, of Let's sins. not reach too far. Yeah. yeah, yeah come on, come on. We gotta make it a believable lie. Here. Come on. <laughs> All right, so with that plug out of the way, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with some listener stories. Welcome back. As we said before the break, on this episode, we're featuring a set of listener stories. But before we get there, uh, both you and I watched something, and I thought it would be fun to talk about it a little bit. Well, I was so excited because I watched it before you did. Yes, I had forgotten completely that the second half of Unsolved Mysteries had dropped, Never, uh, let alone watched it. Well, and I, I like to put stuff on like that when I'm making dinner, because I can like watch it from the counter kind of thing. Right. And one of them popped up and I'm like, wait, what? And it was that whole thing on the ghosts of the big earthquake in 2011. I was blown away because uh, we had done a story on the ghosts of the tsunami and, and mostly around the taxi drivers. And the cool part was that story was incorporated in this episode of Unsolved Mysteries, but there was so much more to it. And I was so excited to watch it. I'd actually forgotten that we'd covered it on, I think it must have been Taxi to Nowhere. Right. Or, sorry, t- Taxi to the Other Side. Right. Uh, on episode 47, we must have talked about that. Mm-hmm. And it, it was really, really interesting to hear these, these stories about lo- people who are basically lost. Yes. You know, who, who died suddenly in overwhelming circumstances and appear to have come back in various capacities mm-hmm. just looking for direction. Yeah. And also, um, there's a great line. Uh, in it by one of the 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 reverend who is the reverend of the the local Shinto Shinto temple, and um, he said the living are upset when people leave and don't say goodbye or don't have a chance to say goodbye. So why would we think you know the dead would be any different? The dead are the same. And he talked about how three months after uh, the tsunami is when the story started, and then by October, which was like four or five months later. It was crazy, like all the stories that were coming out. You know, what I thought was kind of unsettling Hmm. was we tend to talk about the afterlife when we talk about it, I think, in sort of the mainstream conversation. Right. Even in non-religious circles, you know, even say on shows like ours, we tend to talk about the afterlife as kind of the place where you go for peace, you know? Right, right, right. You're delivered unto, unto peace. So it's kind of an unsettling thought that even once you cross over, you can still be kind of discombobulated. Right. Yeah. And not know what's going on. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 if it's not bad enough that you, you know, so you, you died quickly and probably terrified, but now you don't even have the comfort of sort of that, that standard uh, white light and all your relatives coming to see you, you know, you're, you're in some kind of limbo. And that is, that's actually, I think, worse than the thought of death. Well, and, and I think too, like from what I've read and, and the stories I've heard, there is no concept of time. So while you're, you know, you're there going, whoa, why are you still so upset? You know, you died 150 years ago, settle down. That person or that energy is like, this is what happened to me. Like somebody helped me. Like right. this is, this just happened to me. And they communicate very poorly, um, which <laughs> is why everyone gets scared. I was thinking that too, actually, while I was watching and I thought it's a real shame that so much of our conversation around this topic is informed by things like horror movies mm-hmm. where the, the primary purpose is to scare you. You know, and sort of you, you right. cast it within ov- obviously, or pardon me, quite often you cast it within that sort of Christian framework. So you could, because you've got the easily identifiable antagonist. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's either good or bad. And, yeah. you know, so if it's coming back, then it's bad. And I think it's, it's a shame because it limits our ability to kind of get our heads around what's actually happening. Well, and I thought the movie, the others was very, oh, yep, yep. very in some ways informative about what experience the deceased may be having. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. In terms of their limited perception of their situation. Exactly. Knowing something's wrong, right. but not what it is. Right. Um, and trying to deal with it as best they can. And same with The Sixth Sense. That movie, oh my gosh, that movie made so much sense to me. I'll tell you something about The Sixth Sense that I was not expecting because we rewatched that recently during quarantine. Right. I cried a lot 
during that movie. And I was not expecting that. I forgot what a strong emotional core that movie had. Because essentially it's a story of people, right? Yeah, that's it. It's a very human story, but I just completely spaced on that. But there's the scene where the little boy is telling his mother that her mother yes. watches her at night when she's yeah. upset and sad. Yeah. And that just broke me. Yeah. Yeah. Holy man. Yeah. I mean, to this day, it's one of my favorite movies for sure. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And one last thing, uh, because we, we have something that kind of connects to this whole ghost of the uh, tsunami thing. But one last thing that occurred to me is one of the researchers they spoke to on the show, the one who wrote a book about this, I think, although, I, as you said, I believe it's only available in Japanese. He mentions that after other mass death incidents in Japan, and I think he he specifically references a, a, ma a fire and then, of course, the atomic bomb attacks. Right. And he said that there is no public record of these kinds of stories of, of confused people coming back from the dead uh, for those events. So he wondered, you know, what's the sociological reason for that? Because he didn't really believe in ghosts right, as such. Right, right. Kind of wondered if, A, people were just less inclined to commit such things to the public record back then. Right. You know, they may not have been taken as seriously or they may not have been taken at all. Right. You know, it was something that we're, we're not going to include this in the goddamn newspaper. Right. But the other thing that occurred to me is they mentioned that area was, has always been different. Hmm. That that area has always kind of resisted large scale development. They said large parts of it were still rural, which is kind of right, unusual. Right, 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 right. And we've talked before on the show about places which just don't seem to be very receptive to people and where people are not necessarily meant to be. I kind of wonder if this is one of those places, you know, it's one of those natural spots that are very resistant to to development and maybe there's something particular about it that makes it more uh a little more likely for these uh, these things to happen there mm -hmm. no that makes sense to me sort of like the rebel stoke of japan yeah <laughs> and yeah one last thing before we get to the stories the watching th that show uh really reminded me of a conversation i had with bob recently bob vasquez and for those of you who are new to the show, Bob Vasquez is an artist out of Los Angeles who's done a lot of the work that's in our uh, Redbubble and Tea Public stores. Mm -hmm. And he's just an overall ridiculously talented dude. It's really yeah. annoying. But during COVID, he's been volunteering in a clinic. And so he's part of the early morning shift. And he was, he's been saying that something they're dealing with on early morning shifts that they're not really talking about publicly are people who've died from COVID. Wow. Who eh? seem to be hanging around. Yeah. You know, he said they're, they're seeing people in reflections who are then not there. And I, I don't have all the specifics to hand, but it's, again, fascinating that this is something that is ongoing. You know, this is, this is something people are seeing, but another example of something that's not necessarily being committed to the public record. Yeah, yeah. And it would be very hard to do that when it's so fresh. Do you know what I mean? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I get it. All right. Well, that's enough of that. Now on with the stories. Our first story comes from Anonymous. In college, I worked as a janitor to make ends meet. I cleaned the elementary school that I attended as a child, and at first, everything actually seemed really great. I'm an introvert, so working in a huge building that's completely empty seemed ideal. After about a month, though, something about the general atmosphere changed. I no longer felt alone, even though I knew for a fact I was. I didn't like that shit. Around two weeks into the second month, as I collected trash from the rooms, I would hear distant laughter coming from down the hall, always from the same room. Anytime I went to check, nobody was there. I was usually able to brush it off as one of the teacher's kids running around and playing pranks as the elementary and middle school were connected by a series of hallways and many rooms had two entrances. This would have been easy for them to do. In the back of my mind, however, I knew something was going on. I could feel it. I moved on to be the middle school janitor for the next school year and thought that was the end of all this. Like the previous year, everything was fine until a month in. And while I was cleaning the music room, I saw someone dart from the teacher's office and into the hall, followed by the same giggling. Suffice it to say, I was shook, but I continued working. After a brief moment in my truck where I spent some quality time with my class to calm my nerves, of course. When I returned to the building, I got a call from the elementary janitor. I'm honestly scared to ask, but where are you? To which I replied, I'm in the middle school main office. Why? After a few seconds, he answered, 
So who just ran behind me and flicked my neck? We both left soon after for unrelated incidents, but I'm curious as to what would have taken place if we'd stayed. Well, I imagine someone probably would have peed. That's that's <laughs> kind of my first thought. Mall pedal in the hallway won't be the first time, won't be the last. Um, the other thing I'm thinking, it reminds me of when people move into a house or an apartment that's haunted and they're like, well, at first everything seemed fine. You right. know, you never yep. hear, you never hear people moving in and be like the first night we were terrified by the specter of a large mouth dog, you know, like <laughs> it, not that, but little things. And it seems to build. And I, yeah. that's where this was headed to. I do too. Yeah. It's almost like you have to find a level with the place kind of like reach its, I mean, I, I hesitate to say vibration, but that's almost it. You know, you got to go kind of attune to it. Yeah, and is it is it trying to figure you out too? You know what I mean? Yeah, which is not a thought I particularly care for. <laughs> I hear that. That was what happened in my old apartment. You know, my first place there above above Bocce's is it was at first it was amazing because I had you know it's Revelstoke in like two thousand two, so right. I had a hojillion rooms for five hundred something bucks a month. Yeah, and but then over time, yeah, I got less and less comfortable being there. Or having like sleeping with all the doors open and then less and less comfortable sleeping with the doors unlocked. And I don't mean right. the outside door. I mean like the, the inside door. It's like the door to my bedroom. Yeah. And then, yeah, it just kind of went from there. And it, it's, a, it's a shitty feeling because you start, or at least I started questioning my sanity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially if you have nowhere to put what's happening mentally. Yeah. Oh, and I back then I had no clue. Yeah. I, you know, I was yeah. just. Dumb, dumb, dumb. (laughs) This story comes from Sam. While listening to episode 82, The Shadows Know, Brennan's story about having Freddy Krueger dreams reminded me of several experiences I had as a kid that I'd more or less forgotten until now. Between the ages of three to seven years old, I used to be tormented by what Dad insisted were nightmares. They were not. I had covers ripped off my twin-size bed in the middle of the night. They didn't slide off. They were jerked quickly to the ground. The first few times I yelled for my dad. Eventually, I started taking the biggest jump I could off my bed toward the door and running to sleep with him. One time I even tried holding on to them, only to be out-muscled by whatever the fuck wanted my little mermaid comforter. I would also hear scratching on the bottom of the mattress. Dad checked under the bed several times, classic parenting, and there was never anything there. As if those alone were not terrifying enough, I had actual nightmares all the time too. In these nightmares, I was almost always being chased. I don't remember by what. I just remember being terrified and my heart racing well after waking up. The nightmares could have been caused by too much sugar before bed, but given the other events, I can't help but wonder if I wasn't being fucked with by something malevolent. I never saw anything as I was a champion at keeping my eyes closed no matter what. Piecing together the timeline now, it all started shortly after my grandpa died. Dad and I lived with his parents. I do not think it was grandpa. He and I were very close. My first words were Papa, after all. Maybe the negativity around his illness and death let something in. It would be consistent with the shit I dealt with in other little points of my life. I would be interested to hear your thoughts. Unrelated fact, Brennan looks just like my dad when he was younger. Friendly advice, a long grain goatee, no matter what crisis you are having, is a bad idea. You're welcome. (laughs) That's fair. I I can't grow facial hair really very well, so... Oh, well, then we're all spared that, so that's good. We're safe. The the worst I can do is I can, my face kind of looks like uh, like moss creeping across a rock. <laughs> well, you saw my beard. I looked like I belonged in some cave. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, that was a dark time. That was it was an ill advised decision. We'll call uh, it that. I'm glad I did it. I've never had a beard, but I won't do it again. <laughs> Probably for the best. <laughs> I mean, seeing you on the cover of Rugged Mountain Man magazine was fascinating. I was it, very proud of you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was a personal goal. But yeah, no, it wasn't um, Wasn't a very good idea. Beard oil and biceps, the Ian Gibbs story. Yeah, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> when God gifts you with a gift, it's your responsibility to share it with the world. I will say, did you have to share it in such an explicit photo shoot and then send it to me? That wasn't, that wasn't okay. With the headline, read this now. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I know you bought that magazine for a reason. Yeah, because I hoped if I burned it, it would somehow exercise the horrors (laughs) behind my eyes. But no, I remain traumatized to this day. Well, then it was all worth it. If just one person is traumatized. (laughs) That's right. My work here is done. My work flies away. Yeah. 
So what are your thoughts on this one? Definitely heard of bedclothes being pulled off a person. Yeah, we have another story of that later as well. Okay, okay. And that's a definite way they kind of mess with us, either to get our attention or whatever. But I don't think it was a relative. I think it was just a pesky little house spirit. Yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't make sense that that uh, the grandfather would head over to the other side and suddenly set to uh, terrifying the shit out of you. No, no, I don't buy that at all. Although I know when I was, uh, when my when my grandfather died, because he and I were very close, I went through um, this really bad period of, um, I, I think a lot of it was just panic attacks. Right. You know, because he died of cancer and he was diagnosed and died within 30 days. Oh my God. That's it was fast. very, very, very fast. Yeah. Yeah. He, he and my grandmother had been married for, I think, 52 years. Right. And she died that, pardon me, that October. And right. he was gone by mid-June of the next year. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And like that's said, not unusual either. No, that I've, I've heard <laughs> that. Yeah. The, the stress of losing a long-term partner can sort of do that to you. Yeah. But um, I remember just waking up every night like there was this weight on my chest. And, and sometimes I do wonder if there was sort of moments where he tried to reach out, but I was just incapable of understanding what that was. Oh, interesting. Because I I remember horrible nights, like sitting in the shower at three or four in the morning, just trying to, trying to convince myself, you're not dying. You're not dying. You're not dying. Oh, it was a good, it was a bad time. I didn't get this fucked up by chance. And this took, this took work. <laughs> well, good job, Ben. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the other thing that popped into my mind reading this was um, Sam said that the uh, these could have been caused by too much sugar before bed, and I, I don't think that's the case. No, but I went through a period when I first discovered like, iced tea, like actual cold tea. Oh, I did the same thing. I know. What you're oh yes, we we, ha- we have talked about this. Yeah, yeah. I drank we liters and so, so we were both so stupid. We didn't realize it had caffeine in it. Yeah, drank liters and liters. Couldn't figure out why I was waking up in the middle of the night, just drenched in sweat. Yeah, I was nineteen, having heart palpitations. Couldn't figure out why. Yep, yep. Yeah, I it's was like, drinking probably two or three liters at a time. <laughs> yeah, in a sports bottle. Yeah. And that was the second time I'd done it because I did the same thing with Coke Zero <laughs> when I was working at the bottle depot. I developed this twitch in my eye. And why? No, I couldn't. I literally couldn't. I remember hitchhiking and because, you know, one of the functions as a hitchhiker is you sort of serve as the sounding board for whatever trauma the person picking up is going through because that's why they pick up hitchhikers. Yeah. And then you reflect that back at them with whatever horrors it is you've experienced. Sure. And I remember saying, like, I've got this twitch in my eye and I don't know where it's from. And they're probably thinking, like, oh, yeah, no, because you're about to murder me. That's right. You're a serial killer. Got it. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I realized afterwards it's because I was working six days a week at the bottle depot. The the money was garbage. So all we got for perks was free soda. And so I would just pound oh, Coke no. Zero over and over. Oh yeah. <gasps> oh my God. Not to mention the other chemicals in it. That too. Yeah. Between all the yeah, crap yeah. in that soda and the, the caffeine, I will live forever. Or counterpoint. You're, you're dead tomorrow. My heart is going to explode tomorrow. Yeah, one of the one of the. <laughs> a friend of mine was a roofer, and he was working through the summer, and he would, on his way to work, buy himself a liter of Diet Pepsi, and oh, he would drink no. that liter of Diet Pepsi in the morning, and by lunchtime, he would have a blinding headache, and he's like, "Oh, I'm dehydrated," so he'd drink more Pepsi. Oh, and yeah, he did not figure out the the caffeine in the Pepsi was acting as a diuretic. And so he, oh, was, no. he was accidentally dehydrating himself. I'm so thirsty. Why won't the seawater quench my thirst? Exactly. Pretty much. Yeah. So unfortunately, we don't have any more light to shed on that, Sam. But thank you for sharing with us. Mm-hmm. Our next story is from Ashley. So a little backstory. My grandfather on my dad's side had passed away when I was either a baby or before I was born. When I was a little girl, maybe eight or nine, me and my parents moved into a newish house. My dad owned a bar and would work until four, sometimes six in the morning, and so I would sleep with my mom in their bed. It was maybe ten at night. My mom was in the kitchen finishing something. I was in their bed, sitting in the middle, waiting for her to come, and that's when it happened. A man who was wearing a black and red flannel top and an old school winter hunting type hat and sunglasses formed in the hall and stared at me. I didn't feel like it was a bad person or meant any harm. Then he went from the hall to the bathroom. I waited a while, scared shitless, and then ran straight to my mom, scared as fuck. 
Later, I was telling my grandmother, and she acted shocked, and then pulled out a picture of my grandfather, and sure enough, it was him. Nothing like that has ever happened again, and I kind of feel he was just checking in because he never really got to meet me. This next is a short story of the only time I've ever seen what I think is a shadow person. I was in bed with my boyfriend, don't think anything dirty. Why do I feel like that note is in there for me? (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to guess yes, but I didn't want to say it because I'm a good person. Um, okay, let's not compound our sins by lying. <laughs> just laying in the dark talking. It was around 3 to 4 a.m., I think, and I saw something about human height move from the window to behind the TV. I asked my boyfriend if he saw it. He instantly said yes. And before I even told him which way it went, he told me. And I have been scared to be alone in the room ever since. So thanks for sharing that, Ashley. I, I think one of the cruelest things about paranormal experiences is that by and large, I I believe they are transient phenomena. Yeah. But they ruin whole rooms of the house. (laughs) The grandfather thing was sweet though. And it's cool that we, or not, I shouldn't say cool because the first story, Sam's story was not exactly reassuring. But um, again, there's a sort of that common thread of grandfathers. Or yeah, or just family members in general coming back to check on you. And I don't think it applies to that first story because quite frankly... I don't think that's who that was. Yeah, that's a good point. I think she was just sort of trying to put the tail on the donkey on that story, but I don't think that was the actual donkey. Right. Yeah, fair enough. Not that I'm calling your grandfather a donkey. That'd be weird. Stop digging. You're just going to make it worse. I always do. Yep. It's It's my superpower. It really is, actually. I know. I know. Thanks again, Ashley. This next story comes from Lindsay. I wanted to send you an observation I made while listening to episode 96. You read a listener's story, I think their name was Stephen. It was, yeah, that was uh, Stephen's story, about an individual who would see ravens shortly before someone died or fell ill. Brendan mentioned psychopomps, but my first thought was the Morrigan from Irish slash Celtic mythology. If you guys aren't familiar, this three-in-one goddess was associated with death and battle and often took the form of one or several ravens. In addition to being a goddess of war and death, she was also affiliated with prophecy and was supposedly aware of all future events. This seemed particularly fitting to me since the listener mentioned having Irish family members. Now for my story. This happened several months ago and I've been meaning to write to you guys about it ever since. For context, my dad is an alcoholic. After several unsuccessful stints in rehab, my poor mom couldn't take it anymore and separated from him. More accurately, she moved all his stuff into his mom's old house a few miles away from her and hid the spare keys to her place. My dad's house is quite old, for the US at least, And although it's aesthetically very charming, it's always felt a little off. I'm sure my dad's withdrawal-fueled stories of a homeless woman living in the crawl space and giant toads appearing in the toilet don't help, but even when you're alone in the house, there's a pervasive feeling of being watched. My mom and I are both open-minded to the spirit world and have discussed at length the dark presence we feel occupies this house. Addiction is absolutely a disease that requires medical treatment, but we both suspect this entity feeds on my dad in some way. Hmm, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll definitely get into that. Yeah. During my dad's most recent trip to rehab, my mom asked me for help in cleaning the house. He was deep enough into his addiction that he was living in absolute filth. A professional hazmat team would likely have charged several thousand dollars to tackle what we had to deal with in that place. I saged the whole house once, and the entire time my skin was crawling like I was ready to jump out of it. Anyways, I was over there one day by myself to do a few chores for my mom. I had had something to eat and was doing dishes at the kitchen sink. What happened next was difficult to describe. I was thinking about what chores I would do next and picturing the next room over. The dining room has a doorway to the living room. If you stand in it, you can see into the doorway to the kitchen. As I was sort of thinking my way through the house, I saw in my mind's eye a black figure in the dining room doorway to the living room facing the kitchen. It was tall but hunched, with what looked like a bald head and pointed ears. The only discernible features were the eyes, which were more like glowing orbs. Now, I'm a big fan of scary movies and ghost stories, but when I say I felt my hair stand on end, I mean this was a fear I have never experienced from my own imagination. I suddenly felt cold from head to toe, and my arms were covered in goosebumps. My brain shut the image off, but I got the sensation that whatever that thing was was now behind me, watching me. I stopped washing dishes for a moment, took a deep breath, and did my best to quell the desire to bust out the back door screaming. I decided to address it directly and said aloud, You better go away and leave me alone. I'm not easy prey like the one who lives here. I've dealt with worse than you before and will likely again in the future. Oh, wow. Yeah, no kidding. That's badass. 
I conjured the image of white light within me and a spiritual barrier around me, and after a few moments the cold sensation subsided, as though this thing went back to wherever it likes to hide. I finished my work there, still feeling unsettled, and have not gone back alone since. Not long after this, my younger brother moved in with my dad. I didn't tell him this story, but I did mention being uncomfortable in the house. He told me he had personal objects move around, as in mysteriously turn up in the backyard, and frequently felt like he was being watched. I can only hope that whatever is lurking in that house doesn't feed on him too. Thanks for all you do, and I hope to meet you in BC someday when Americans learn how to act right. Well, let's, let's not wait for that, <laughs> Lindsay. I mean, that, that might, that, we might be waiting a while, but it, it, yeah. <laughs> we would love that, absolutely. Oh my goodness. So, you know, I, there's so much in there. Yeah. And I don't really want to dwell on sort of the uh, the dark part of this because I know we have a really heavy message coming up later in the show. Mm-hmm. But I will say I very much sympathize with, with what you're going through. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a lot of addiction in my family. Uh, my own father, I, we haven't spoken in a very, very long time. And the last I heard, he, he himself was an addict. And it was a very, very difficult thing to, for everyone to deal with. Mm-hmm. So that is, yeah, my heart goes out to you. That's, that's a tough, that's a tough pull. Well, and I definitely think people with addiction issues are easy prey in some ways for negative spiritual energy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and also it is either their addiction issues that can enhance the haunting or it can be the haunting that drives them further into the addiction issues, you know, like it's not good. Yeah. It's almost like the two things kind of feed off each other. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, For sure. Someone else I know, another friend, uh, they went through, I I have to be very, very general, but they went through a similar situation with a loved one uh, suffering this way. And they actually visibly, not just in their mind's eye, but visibly saw entities in in this loved one's house. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was almost like whenever this person went out, you know, they they spent some time in some pretty dark places and it just seems like things clung to them and followed them back. Oh, wow. And um, the other thing that, that occurred to me is we've sort of experienced a variation of this, you and I, in the old office. Mm-hmm. Because this sort of Nosferatu type creature she saw in her mind's eye that felt very, very real. Yeah. There were times where, you know, you and I tried to white light the office. Yeah. And it felt like something was dodging. Yep. You and know, like, and was very unhappy with us. Yes. <laughs> and I, I never got a sense of what it looked like. I, to me, because I, 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 my, my sense of this is a little less developed. I was just, I saw like a, a, like a kind of wiry shadow thing just dodging. Mm-hmm. That, that was sort of my vision of it. But it, definitely something we, we've heard of before. Although, yeah. thankfully, I, I don't think ours was actually malevolent. I, I think, I mean, I do think there was negative presence in that building. Mm-hmm. But I think what would come to visit us, kind of in retrospect, I don't think it was necessarily bad. No, but I definitely think it had its own agenda, so. Oh, interesting. Do you have any kind of thoughts as to what that is? Nope. Okay. Well, well, that's... <laughs> I literally don't. I wasn't in the building as much as you were, so I just know that it, it, I don't know. I think it resented us being there after dark, to be honest with you. Yeah, I agree with you there because yeah. I, I really found that, especially on the second floor, you know, being there past, uh, used to be 11 or 12 and then it got earlier. Mm. It was like, it was demanding more and more of the floor. Right. Right. So yeah, no, it, uh, funny enough, I almost never go near there anymore. Oh. I, I spent so much of my life in that, in and around that building for six, seven years. Right. And it just felt like a weird kind of home. And the second our listener, I think it was our listener, Alexa, actually kind of helped us come to terms with what was going on there and kind of reach out and, and reach a sort of detente with at least one of the spirits of the building. She said that there was something else that was much more negative, but it was more intermittent. Right. Uh, once that was done and, you know, the, the people who were renting us the office, they lost the space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just never there. And I don't miss it, I tell you. No, no, I get that. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I walked past it so much this halloween season but uh oh of course i i um definitely am happy to not <laughs> be having to go in there a lot <laughs> oh for a while I, I kept a key just to the outside door just right. so i could you know if i wanted to go in and use the can or or you know right and what i very quickly realized no that's just not going to happen i just have no desire to be in that space again isn't that weird eh yeah it's just like a, the page is turned i am done eventually i just uh I think I dropped the, the key in the letterbox for the, the landlord and, and that was the end of it. Maybe you just had to do what you had to do there and now it's all over. Yeah. Well, thanks again for sharing with us, Lindsay. And um, I hope things go okay with your brother being in that space. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably a good idea to just to check on him. I was going to say that. Yeah, check in on him, make sure he's okay. Yeah, and, and I mean, he, he may not fully understand why you're checking in or, or fully buy into why you're checking in, but I think if, you've, if you're perceptive enough to see what you saw just by kind of casually browsing the house, I think using the same approach is, is a good idea with your brother. Yeah, I agree. Take care and uh, yeah, keep us updated. Our next story is from Mayra. My father is a truck driver and would only spend a very little time with us. He physically abused my mother. Seeing the fight was not something out of the ordinary. He only targeted me once. He hit me with a fly swatter enough to bruise me up. I may have deserved it, though I was a handful as a child, according to my mom. Mm, no, 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 sorry. No, 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 I'm not going to go with that. As a kid who put up with physical abuse, no, you, you did nothing to deserve that. We did talk about it, and he cried and apologized. I should add, he was always the nicer, more loving parent with me. He never again hurt me physically. Only a handful of times did he emotionally hurt me. However, the one that did the most of my character shaping was my mother. Now, I do not recall being a horrible child, just one that was curious about everything. Nonetheless, that was taken out of me with harsh words over the years. At around the age of 12, I was a brave kid. I could watch horror movies and not fear because I knew they weren't real. I would stay home alone and take care of my five-year-old brother every weekend so my parents and sister could go to dances. During this time, we lived in a house in Sullivan, Texas that my dad was constructing. It all began when my 19-year-old sister and I moved into my bedroom upstairs. Her room was not entirely done, so we settled away from our parents and enjoyed our privacy. We were watching TV one night when my little brother walked in and quietly sat in front of the TV. He was sleepwalking, which he'd never done before. We were shocked, but my sister just carried him downstairs before my parents realized he was gone. Another night, my sister and I were watching TV when we heard heavy, and by heavy, I mean on the verge of stomps, coming up the stairs. So we turned the TV off and pretended to be asleep. My heart pounded with each step. Then we saw the hall light turn on and saw the shadow of what we thought was our father's feet standing outside the bedroom door. We saw the light turn off. And to our surprise, we didn't hear the steps going down, but we were too scared to even worry about that. My dad is a no BS guy. Everything is either black or white to him. There's no area for gray. So the next day, upset that he had scared us, we confronted him and were told he had not gone upstairs. We brushed it off as nothing. Maybe he lied, but we were not the type to call him a liar. We knew better. Eventually, my sister's room was finished and she moved out. One evening, while scrolling through the dial on my boombox's FM radio tuner, yes, a grip in the 90s, yeah, <laughs> looking for midnight <laughs> magic songs, I heard a woman yell. Just thinking of it gives me chills. I jumped up and walked to my door, opened it, and stuck my head out. At that exact moment, my sister walked out of her room. We looked at each other and in sync asked, did you hear that? We ran downstairs to wake my mom up because dad's a heavy sleeper, and she came upstairs with us. She called one of our neighbors and asked if she'd heard something, to which the lady said no, but she saw a white lechuza flying over our house. We are Hispanic, so my mom believes that a lechuza is a witch. Mom brought a crucifix and holy water, and I was to put the crucifix between our rooms. My sister and mom were blessed in the hallway when my sister yelled and ran straight to her room. She said she heard footsteps behind her, as if they were stepping into the holy water. My mom got mad at us for being foolish and sent us to bed. Like I mentioned earlier, I would stay home alone a lot, and that didn't bother me. I even had my own set of keys from the time I was nine years old. I should note that I grew up with dogs and loved having them because they gave me comfort and love. I can't remember a time I didn't have a dog to care for. One afternoon after school, I got home and for whatever reason, my parents had left my white fluffy puppy inside the house. When I got inside, he started to bark and jump like dogs normally do when their owners are home. So I took the leash off and let him run. But what he did terrified me. He ran straight to my front door and began growling and barking at nothing. I kept calling him, but he wouldn't stop. And so I grabbed my backpack, my pup, and I ran up to my room where I locked myself in. I didn't come out until my parents got home. I told them what happened, but of course they didn't believe me. To make a long story short, the puppy died not long after that. At the age of 14, I found myself living upstairs alone since my sister had gotten married and left. 
My little brother, who was now seven, still slept with my parents downstairs, regardless of the fact he'd had his own finished bedroom right in front of mine. I didn't mind, though, because I could stay up watching TV or reading without any interruptions. Since I was always alone upstairs, I would keep all the room doors open. One day, I was cleaning my room, listening to the radio, sweeping and dusting away when my bedroom door slammed shut. I was alone in the house, so I opened the door and went back to work when, I kid you not, my sister's dresser drawer opened hard. I freaked out, but went to check it out. Again, there was no one in there, so I closed the drawer and went back to work. Now, before you say it was already open, I could see it from my bedroom. I had a clear view of her dresser. Sometime after that, the worst experience I have ever had happened to me. I would wake up at 5.55 a.m. every day to get ready for school. One morning, I opened my door into the pitch black hallway and something in my sister's door caught my eye. A little girl with long, straight hair, her body angled in a way that made it seem like she wanted me to see her. Terrified and unable to yell, I slammed my door shut. I was at a cross point. I could either stay petrified in my room and have to deal with mom, or I could run for it to the restroom and get ready to leave for school. I got my stuff and ran as fast as I could for the restroom door, never looking back. I told my mom what had happened later that day, and instead of comforting me, she said it was my imagination. And I shouldn't be saying things like that because I would attract things. So much for comfort. Well, at least you know, Mara, you're, it's more typical than not. <laughs> this is true. We finally moved out in March 2007. We moved into a brand new home closer to the university I'd be attending in a couple of months. We didn't sell that house and it stayed vacant for years. We would go check on it from time to time, but got out as fast as we could. My husband, then boyfriend, went with me once to check on the house and he sent something. He isn't a believer and has not experienced anything before, but he said he didn't feel right in the house. My parents ended up selling the house and not having to check on it anymore, but that hasn't stopped me from dreaming about it. More on that later. We moved to our new home and everything seemed better, except my parents were getting increasingly violent with one another. Again, this was nothing out of the ordinary because I grew up seeing that, but it was getting worse. My boyfriend would come over and watch movies on the weekends and my mom had a habit of creeping up behind us to make sure we were not doing inappropriate things. One night, we clearly heard footsteps, like when wet feet moved over tiled floors. We both turned around but didn't see her, so I got up and checked, and nothing. Before my boyfriend left, we talked about how odd that was, but called it a night. That night, my mom was pounding on my door. When I opened it, she said there was stomping in the attic. I assured her it was nothing, left the door open, and went back to bed. As I closed my eyes, I heard it, pounding right over my bedroom ceiling. I ran so fast I did not recall stepping on each step on the staircase and yelled for my mom like never before. She met me at the foot of the staircase and said, told ya. We called the police and they checked everything, doors, attic, bedrooms, yard, yet they found nothing. Creepy things would happen in my bedroom from time to time. One night while on the phone with my boyfriend, I felt as if something was in my bedroom watching me. It was in the top corner of the room, which was darker than normal, and that really scared me. I got up and turned the restroom light on so that I could sleep. My bedroom also had a balcony, which was locked. I had the key, but couldn't open it without the alarm going off. Yet at least three times that night, I woke to the balcony door being wide open and no alarm triggered. My final experience in that house was one late night after my closing shift around midnight. I got home and mom wasn't there yet, so I tried to open the back door to get in and it wouldn't budge. I turned the doorknob and pushed it and gave it gave a little and then felt as if it was pushed shut back towards me. I ran to my car and called my mom, who did not answer, of course, so I called my dad. I knew he was driving, but he always answers my calls. I told him I was scared and he said mom should be there soon. Just then she drove up and I told her what happened. She checked the house and told me it was empty, but I know what I felt. I know it wasn't just me. Things got better after I got married and left my parents. Unfortunately, my parents ended up in a divorce and the house was repossessed. But I think that was the best for all of us. When I was 25, I had my very last experience. My five-month-old son was sleeping on his swing and had just, I had just hung up with my husband who would be home in an hour for lunch. I was cutting some potatoes when over my shoulder and right in my ear, I clearly heard, Hey! The voice sounded like my husband, but he was working. I yelled and began to pray. I still don't know what that was, but it never bothered me again. I now have a two-year-old daughter. 
and she reminds me so much of me, attitude and all. Well, recently I've been having nightmares that I'm in the house in Sullivan and my daughter is in harm's way. In one of the dreams, a truck drove into the house and I ran in the house trying to get my daughter out. Then in a different dream, I'm walking up that staircase worrying about my daughter and I don't know why. The last dream I had was trying to get into her room, but there's an attic ladder blocking the door. I do not know why that house continues to haunt me in my dreams, but what worries me most is why my daughter... Is it trying to indicate something? So thank you for sharing all that with us, Mira. I know that's uh, some very personal stuff in there. Mm-hmm. And I know I have my own thoughts about the house and the dream, but I'm, I, as our resident dream master, I'm curious <laughs> to know your thoughts. I don't think it's anything coming after your daughter, but I do think it's probably your own past kind of trauma with that situation that's manifesting that way. Because the biggest thing we want for our kids is for them to have a better life than we did. And one of the fears is essentially that they won't, right? That they'll, right. they'll have a, a, a not great upbringing. And, and that's our responsibility as parents. At least that's how we see it. So I think that's really probably more what that is. It just shows yeah. you, you really, really love your daughter and you want the best things for her. And our, like I say, our biggest fear is that that won't come, that won't happen. That won't come true. And I think that's what that dream is about. So I would not worry about anything weird and creepy coming after her. I think, you know, you're, you're probably fine. Yeah. That, that was my takeaway too. I, I, I know when I was a kid, I spent a, a lot of formative time in my grandparents' house. And right. even now as an adult, I still dream about it and I'll have nightmares there or I'll have good dreams there. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just, we, we go back to the places in our minds our, our subconscious brings us back to the places that were formative for us. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, yeah, casting someone, someone thing you, you care so much about in a place that was dangerous to you is kind of making that fear manifest. Right. Yeah. 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 So I agree. Yeah. So no, no, no worries there. I, I think you are, you are fine as far as that goes. I agree. I just imagine the horror of being a kid. Like you are totally at the mercy of the people around you. 100%. And, you know, I, I, my childhood was pretty easy. As I said, my, my old man, he had problems and he mm-hmm. was not an easy man to get along with. But even so, it, it was never as bad as, as what I know you had to deal with or what Mira had to deal with. Mm-hmm. And I just think, you know, I, how lucky I was to have come through it relatively unscathed. I mean, I'm, I'm fucked up, but for different reasons. <laughs> But yeah, it just, the, the thought of being a kid again and being that vulnerable and sort of, uh, just completely at the mercy of the world is a yeah. terrifying thought. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I hear you. Great story though. And I'm, you know, I like, yeah, I'm sorry for what you went through, but it sounds like you, you definitely came out with it with the strength you went into it with. So good for you. All right. So our final suite of stories tonight come from Courtney. There are five stories total. And uh, the first one, which I'll be telling you now, is called Mommy. Also, I should point out that these stories are all set in the state of Mississippi. This is where Courtney grew up. I, I think I've removed specific references to addresses. Mm. Uh, but yeah, Courtney grew up in the state of Mississippi. Mommy. I once lived in a duplex built in the 50s. It wasn't creepy, but it felt very lived in and like it was never my home. It felt sort of icky. One night I was laying in bed when I heard a tiny knock at the bedroom door behind me. I held my breath. A child's breathy whisper then said, Mommy? I said nothing. Mommy, is that okay? All I could hear following that was silence. That same deafening silence that always follows when I have an encounter with something different than what I should know. I laid there holding my breath, now with my eyes closed. Nothing else was said, however, so I worked up some bravery and looked towards the door. I saw no one, but the door was cracked about five inches wide. I moved shortly after, but never heard the little voice ask for mommy again. Which is a relief, because the voices of small children are terrifying to begin with, (laughs) and especially when you're not expecting them. Agreed. My entire adult life, I have been afraid of unexpected children, Ian. And, uh, <laughs> more ways than one. Yeah. Well, no, pretty much in just the one, but, uh, Oh, you mean you're okay with them suddenly popping up in front of you on an airplane? As long as they're not mine, as long as he's not popping up and saying, dad, then we're fine. <laughs> a, a couple of years ago, I was walking down the hallway of our building and 
this little kid was playing in the lobby and I, I, I as I was walking away I heard her go daddy and I nearly started running <laughs> it's that bad it is kitty corner one of the first ghostly settings that I can remember happened at the kitty corner I was probably about seven and was on the porch looking in the room on the left side of the door there was a boy in light blue fancy clothes who walked straight up to the window and looked back at me he had blonde curly hair big curls at the time i thought he was dressed funny in some kind of Strasbourg lacy looking john john or some shit but i was <laughs> distracted because we were told that no bigger kids could be in that room this kid must have been three or four which i recall as being in the wrong age group to be in that room i never saw through him so i never suspected he was a ghost until I actually mouthed off to one of the teachers saying, I thought no one was allowed in that room. The teacher looked in the same window and told me no one was there. I could still see the boy and told her as much, at which she looked at me again and then said, there's nobody in there. You're just crazy. Now get back in the line. Oh, Jesus. That just, that sums up my childhood. There's nobody there. You're crazy. Get back in line. I got back into line and stood over the thought that I'd just been lied to. It didn't dawn on me until years later that I'd actually seen a little ghost boy. I've tried to research the property just to see if there's any family history to pour over, but the library claimed to not have much info on that house. I repeat, being a kid is awful. It is. Yeah. No one believes you. No one will let you do anything. It sucks. Imagine being that teacher. This, this, this is your life. Just screaming at a child. You're lying dead in line. Like you've literally stepped out of that, that Pink Floyd's The Wall movie. Mm-hmm. And it, you, I, like I wonder Matilda. if they have any... Like Matilda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. You wonder, do, do they have any awareness? Do they wake up in the morning and go, um, man, I am a shitty person? I don't think so. Oh, man. No, they're probably like, goddamn kids, I gotta go hang out with them again. Yeah, I guess. Right? Yeah. I mean, at least I acknowledge it. I wake up every morning and go, man, I am the worst. <laughs> Let's get that bread, you know? <laughs> the ghost in the duplex. This takes place in a house in Columbus, Mississippi, near the Catholic Church. I lived there by myself for a few weeks before my sister and her boyfriend, now husband, moved in. Miss Willie was our landlady, and she still had the old South accents, and when she spoke my name, it was three syllables. Coordinate. I remember the first night I stayed in the house alone. It was a duplex, so the apartment was set up like a shotgun house, like you had to go through a bedroom to get into the kitchen, and you had to go through a bedroom and kitchen to get to my bedroom. The whole shotgun house concept baffles me. Oh, it's it's weird and creepy, to be honest with you. I would sooner pass through hell than walk through a stranger's bedroom to go to the bathroom. I, I would literally, you, a ring of fire would be less intimidating for me than well, walking through some rando's bathroom, <laughs> bedroom just so I can go take a leak. But I understand. Um, I understand it. Because basically what it was, was a way of using every piece of available space you didn't waste any space on a hallway right okay right so that's the concept behind that but yeah i don't think it worked out very well no nope, on this way i agreed i remember feeling on edge the first night even though i had a bed i chose to sleep on the day bed i had doubling as a couch in the front room i couldn't close my eyes and kept looking at the bedroom doorway it was darker than usual it always was we would frequently travel to places like Tupelo in New Orleans. On one trip, we'd gone to New Orleans, and the really interesting stuff started when we came back. One night, I woke up to hearing what sounded like an acoustic song, very loud, and made out the words, Wishing You Were Here, before it trailed off. No, it was not Pink Floyd. I hate them, and I'd know. It was something I hadn't heard, something old-timey. It never woke my husband. The next night, I woke up to something touching my feet. A light touch across the tops of my toes on my right foot. I kicked a little and covered my toes. Then the sheets were pulled up and my toes touched again. Not okay. This time I tucked my toes tightly under the sheet, sat bolt straight, and looked around. I saw nothing, but I knew there was something there, located slightly diagonally of me. The room was humid, a sort of sickly hot. I said, don't you touch me, wrapped back up and closed my eyes. I know I was holding my breath, though. I was so scared. I kept nudging my husband, and he was stirring, but not yet awake. Then the sheet ripped up past my knee, and I felt a very fast, cold touch across my toes and up my shin to my knee. I was terrified at this point. I again angrily demanded to be left alone, and then that silence happened. 
You know, the silence that almost rings, it's so still. Like a vibration almost. Then I felt a finger touch the center of my forehead, crossing and tucking my hair behind my left ear. Oh, what a prick. Then he was gone. I know it was a he, of course it was. He never returned in that capacity, but we didn't stay long after that. I told my husband, and he confessed that strange things had been happening to him too. Ah, there you go. Yeah. He said he had been hearing me call his name when I wasn't home. We left for the 11th Street property, which turned out to have its own share of spookiness. That is aggressive. Yeah, that's not very nice. Holy smokes. I, I mean, if, if ever there has been a case in this show that warranted the existence of the Ghostbusters, it's that. Yeah, yeah. Just for being an absolute dick. <laughs> like, don't well, do that. Well, it was that. probably from a time when men owned women. Do you know what I mean? Like, Right, yeah. You, you were chattel as a woman, so he could. it didn't matter what you said. Oh, no. The, the, the sweetest thing that could happen is watching that bastard descend into the Ghostbusters trap and then get <laughs> stuck in that wall vault thing. I, I would, no, I'd be fine. You know, that's not real, right? <laughs> Don't yeah. ruin this for me, guys. I got it. That documentary, The Ghostbusters, that I yeah. love. Alice. When I was five, my sister and I were sharing a bed when I woke up to what I thought was my grandmother, who lived in West Virginia, calling my name. Courtney, she said. All I want is a hug. I opened my eyes to see her standing there in a very light blue gown-like dress. I rubbed my eyes and said I was sleepy. She held her arms outstretched towards me and again she said, all I want is a hug. So I stood up in bed and started to walk around my sister to get to grandma. She had white hair and was bright. I thought maybe the streetlight outside was shining on her. She wasn't floating. She wasn't transparent. She was just standing there with her arms outstretched. Again, she said, I just want a hug. Just as I got to the corner of my bed, within a foot of her arms, I sort of jerked back. By that time, I'd woken up enough to realize that not only was my grandma not visiting Mississippi at that time, but that she still colored her hair black. I looked at my sleeping sister and took off from my parents' room. I could still hear her, only this time she sounded hurried and troubled. Courtney, come back. All I want is a hug. Just as soon as I was able to shake my mom awake, the screaming stopped. I told her all about it, and she told me it was nothing, that I could sleep on their floor. I told that story for years, and then one day my grandmother said, Damn it, Vicky, my mom, do you know who she's talking about? She's talking about Alice. Alice was my grandmother's sister. It passed away when I was a baby. We buried her in that. I am not convinced that was Alice. Frenzy ghost calling to me in the night, desperately demanding a hug. Well, maybe you haven't experienced this because you haven't had kids, but... Sure, no one wants to hug me. We've covered this. I, I, I grant that. Absolutely. And I that was, restraining order doesn't help. I, yeah, that whole profile in America's Most Wanted. At least someone finally wanted me, Ian. <laughs> I was going to say, um, when you have kids and you go to visit elderly relatives, sometimes you're walking a fine line between giving your kid a voice to express their wishes and boundaries on their own bodies and making the elderly relatives happy who want to hug your kid right because sometimes like i was never a kid who was like oh hug me like no get away from me i'm still i'm the same way like if i mean yeah, every you, time you wake up to see me standing over you're like yeah, oh, get out of here again. get out of here yeah how did you chew through the restraints um <laughs> so it's just weird for me that i understand it because if it was an elderly relative who hadn't seen her and was excited to see her, it would be a, I just want to hug. I just want to hug. But we kind of had that problem a few times with some older relatives where, um, you know, my son was like, I don't want to hug you. And then they're like, oh, he's being so rude. And we would have to be like, well, no, actually, he's not being rude. He's explaining how he feels about this. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's, uh, I, I, oh God, that drives me crazy. I know. Uh, and it happens all the time. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Childhood is a nightmare. <laughs> exactly. This is the last of Courtney's stories and the last of our stories for tonight. It's titled, I see you. This happened at Memphis state university in the summer of 1991. I was there for cheer camp and each squad had two girls per room. Our room shared a bathroom with the adjoining room. We were there for only three days, maybe four. Every day before we left, my roommate and I would make sure the bathroom door was locked and that one of us kept a key to the room door tied to a shoestring. 
Day one, we arrived after practice to find the door unlocked and a wet spot on the carpet in the middle of the room. We shrugged it off and thought we must have forgotten to lock the door. As for the wet spot, we couldn't find an obvious source and we didn't talk about it after that. Day two, we returned to the room and again the bathroom door was unlocked. Not only that, but something else was weird, but I don't really recall what. At this point, I thought it was someone trying to scare us. On the second to last morning, I purposely put my key inside a desk drawer by my bed and my roommate tied her key onto a shoelace. We both made sure that the bathroom door and bedroom doors were locked. When we came back home, both doors were unlocked and the wet spot in the floor was much larger. This time, my key was sitting on top of the desk directly above where I had left it. By this time, we were a little freaked out. There had been issues of boys getting in the dorm and we worried about security. Still, I needed a shower, so decided to take one. Now, as far as I knew, I was all alone, and both doors to the bathroom were locked, so I felt safe. As I was taking my shower, I heard what I thought was a female voice calling my name, except very hollow sounding, as if through a tunnel or something. I didn't answer, but the call came again. Courtney, look at me. This time I heard it clearly and told whoever it was to go away. I needed privacy. I looked out each side of the shower curtain to check and made sure both doors were locked, which they were. I hurried up with the washing because I was a little spooked by this time. Then it came again, this time more stern, but still playful. Courtney, just look at me. I can see you and you're naked. I looked around again. No one. I told whoever it was to go away. Silence. Then it spoke again. Courtney, just look at me. If you look, you can see me. Frustrated, I replied, Where are you? Then the voice that had sounded like a woman's dropped to a deep, growling man's voice and spoke in a slow monotone. I'm in the vent. I'd had enough. I quickly turned off the water, grabbed my towel, and stumbled into the bedroom. No one was there, so I wrapped my towel tightly and ran down the hall to find no one was even near our room. All the girls had congregated into two rooms about six down from ours. I asked if anyone was messing with me and I got confused looks, so I went ahead and got ready for bed. I was frazzled for sure, but slept. The next morning I packed all my stuff up and went to the bathroom one last time before we left for competition. As I was sitting there, I looked up and in the stall, directly across from the bathtub, high up on the wall was a vent. A very small one, no bigger than a shoebox. To this day I'm so very thankful I never thought to look up over the shower curtain towards that vent. The most interesting thing to note in all my storytelling is that once I left Mississippi, I cut off all desire and curiosity towards the paranormal, and everything stopped. I have lived in Alabama now for nearly 20 years, and I have had nothing obviously strange happen. Not until recently. Recently is mostly synchronicities, but they are numerous. So thank you so much for sharing all this with us, Courtney. Mm -hmm. And that, that shower one scared the shit out of me. That was creepy, and the voice you did there was perfect, by the way. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I, I kind of thought, well, maybe, you know, it's if they had issues with, with guys trying to get in, maybe it was just someone peeping, you know, Porky style from the vent. Right. But I guess it raises the question of whether there was any place like that for them to access, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know. It, it's, there's such a violation there. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, like the idea of, like for me, I like locking doors. Whenever I'm in somewhere, um, I lock a door, I lock the door, or if I'm leaving, I always lock the door. You know, right. people who don't lock their doors make no sense to me. Right. And the idea of doing that, of securing your space and then yeah. finding out that it doesn't matter what you do, someone else can violate that and get in there. That's, that really is unnerving. Well, and not only that, but rubbing your face in it. Yes. That's messed up. Yeah. No, whatever was, if, if it was something, uh, non-human, that is, yeah. That's scary. And if it was something human, that's even scarier because that's a very real danger. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyways, thank you so much again for the stories, Courtney. And thanks to everyone who sent us their stories. We mm -hmm. love hearing them. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we try and get as many as we can in the show. And trust us, even if we don't get it in the show, we read everything you send. Mm -hmm. If you have a story you want to share, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com is the best way to do it. Uh, there's also the ghost line, but we'll talk about that after the break. Hey everybody, Brennan here. 
I just wanted to take a second to shout out another podcast that I think you guys will enjoy, and that is Finances, the other F word. If you've been listening to our show for a little while, that'll sound familiar to you, and that's because Mel, Zoe, and Stormy, the hosts, had me on a couple months back to talk about the economics of small-scale podcasting. And that's very much their thing. They're a Gen Xer podcast where they discuss music and money without all the pretentious bullshit that can come with both those subjects. They explore a lot of really interesting topics. They did a four-parter on the economics of discrimination, and they recently did another deep dive into the economic realities behind the Defund the Police movement. So they're not afraid of controversial subjects. You can find them by searching for Finances, the other F word, wherever you stream your podcasts. And they're also on Facebook as Finances, the other F word. Check them out. Welcome back. As always, thanks to the rest of the team, Luke Greensmith, Anthony Germain, and Sarah Kent for their work on this and every episode we couldn't do without you guys. Next up, patron shoutouts. Of course, we'd like to thank all our patrons. You guys are, you are the, the beating heart of this terrible colossus. It's true. If, if the heart wasn't beating, we would be dead in the water. <laughs> so true. So thank you from the bottom of, of our awful souls. And of course, we'd like to thank all our patrons, but we'd especially like to thank our most recent patrons. They are. D.H. Scarlett O'Donovan. Shannon Morton. Rachel Melnick. Meg S. Chris Murphy. Sarah Condon. April Cook. Larissa McLean. J. Anthony Thompson. Teresa R. Amy Hunter. Melissa M. Dittmanson. Alexa McFarlane. Kaylee. Ariel. Charlotte Clary. Stacy Hutchin. Thank you so, so much, guys. Mm-hmm. We, we've had a real surge in support there, and, and it's very, very encouraging, and it, it yeah. means a lot. It really does. If you want to join the team, head on over to patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. That's patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. There are physical rewards like stickers, magnets, art cards of My Night Photography, and of course, Ian's smash hit Christian Country album, Aware of Wonder. And then you get access to all the digital rewards. And there have actually been a lot of those recently. There's uh, extra little audio drama. You get our, our monthly Cabin Fever show, which is Ian and I shooting the breeze about all the stuff going on in our life that we either can't admit to publicly and have to hide <laughs> behind a paywall or just don't have time for in the main show anymore. There's our monthly live show, and last month, and it's still up if you subscribe. Actually, this one's open to anyone, but if you look into the archive, you can see our entire, I want to say almost two-hour-long Halloween live show Mm -hmm. with Kev from We Need to Talk About Ghosts, Paul from Mysteries and Monsters, and JC and Kiki from Mission Spooky. So there's all kinds of cool stuff waiting for you over at patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. If you want to get in touch, you can send us an email at ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at twitter.com slash ghoststoryguys, Facebook at facebook.com slash ghoststoryguys, and Instagram at instagram.com slash the ghoststoryguys. But if you want to send a story, email is the best way to do it, unless, of course, you don't feel like typing, and then you can call the ghost line. There's something strange. Big thanks, as always, to our listener Amber Pease for her ghost line jingle. And that number again is one 588 6920 And you can call us with your comments, your questions, your gentle criticisms. We want to hear it all. And that is one way for you to get in touch. You can leave your message as one or a series of voicemails. I think it times out after three minutes. And that's a toll-free number all over North America. So feel free to call. And if you are outside North America, but you want to send us a voice message, you totally can. Just use the voice app on your phone to record the message and email it to us at ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. And those messages will get played on the mini shows, which happen every other week opposite to this show. Mm-hmm. And we do love being able to play those for you guys. Finally, if you don't feel like calling, you can text us at 925-553-4789. That's 925-553-4789. If you want to find us individually on the net, I'm largely the truth on both Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Ghost Story Guy on Instagram and Ian Gibbs on Facebook. As far as things coming up, uh, the only new thing is we did an interview with Booze and Bourbon. We talked about that on the mini show and it's, uh, it, it was not out when the mini show dropped, but it should be out by the time this drops. 
I just had a message from Kim the other day. So I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that conversation plays because we had a blast on the phone with them. Just before we go, a reminder that Ian's book, Victoria's Most Haunted, is now available in audio format, uh, read by yours truly. And you can find that anywhere you buy audiobooks, including Audible, Amazon, places like that. And you can also pick up my book, A Strange Little Place, The Hauntings and Unexplained Events of One Small Town on Amazon and Audible. <laughs> If you want to pick up some Ghost Story Guys merch, head on over to our website at ghoststoryguys.com. You can find links to our Redbubble and Tee Public stores. There's also a link there to our Big Cartel store where you can buy signed copies of our books. We also have stickers, art cards of my night photography, pins, and lots of other stuff. So again, that's ghoststoryguys.bigcartel.com or head to ghoststoryguys.com and follow the links from there. Don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you can rate and review podcasts. It just helps bump our visibility and we love hearing what you have to say about the show. Our theme song, Radio, Into the Darkness We Go, is composed and performed by Peter of Pizzanta Music. You can find more from him at soundcloud.com slash Music. Our story's theme is The Future Belongs to Them Now by Hexagram. You can find more from them by searching for Hexagram everywhere you stream your music. That's Hexagram with two X's, not three. Their new single, One Good Scare, is available everywhere. It's a fantastic song. Make sure you check it out. And all other music and sound effects on this show were provided courtesy of Epidemic Sound. If you're looking for podsafe music or sound effects for your next project, head on over to epidemicsound.com to check them out. I guess that's going to do it. I think it is. We'll be back in two weeks with another show, and until then... Into the darkness we go. Oh, out in Langford there. Yeah, well, that's where we all live. Of course. Towny. <laughs> Suburban <laughs> scum. <laughs> where did these <laughs> macaroons come from? <laughs> you whore. I well, regret saying that. You now. know what I do with your mom. Oh. Hey, Kathy. And now you die. <laughs>